Hello friends, how are you? My name is Rizwan Afiz and uh, again today we are going to talk about G protein coupled receptor. Uh, so first of all, let me uh, revise that why this receptor is called as G protein coupled receptor or G protein linked receptor. This receptor is called as G protein coupled receptor because the intracellular domain of this receptor is attached with a protein called as G protein. So this is the reason <coughs> this receptor is called as G protein linked receptor or G protein coupled receptor. And here you can see that this G protein consists of three subunits, alpha subunit, beta subunit and uh, gamma subunit. The alpha subunit is also attached with a GDP molecule as well. The outer side of this protein uh, will be having binding site for the ligand. This ligand can be a drug, it can be a hormone, it can be a neurotransmitter, anything. So obviously the response will be initiated when this ligand will bind with this binding site and uh, then uh, this G protein will help in the initiation of response and we will uh, see in the later part of the video as well. This G protein uh, coupled receptor is also called as 7 pass transmembrane receptor because this receptor passes from the cell membrane 7 times. Here you can see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and 7. It passes 7 times so this is the reason it is called as 7 pass transmembrane receptor. <clears throat> Well, in the previous video, I have explained that G protein is of three types, GS protein, GQ protein and GI protein. And all the proteins will show different response. So it's not only the ligand that is going to determine which kind of response will be produced, but this G protein also determine that which kind of response will be produced. And different uh, G protein will produce different response as well. Clear? Uh, the response and the signaling mechanism followed by the GS protein has been discussed in the previous video. Uh, like uh, cyclic AMP uh, dependent pathway. In this video, I will talk about the GQ protein and GI protein mediated response. So, let's talk about when this ligand will attach with this uh, binding site at the outer side of the receptor the GTP molecule will be converted into GTP the GTP that was attached with the alpha domain it will be converted into GTP and at this conversion all these factors all these subunits alpha, beta and gamma they will get separated from each other they will get separated and GD, GTP will attach with alpha now after the attachment of this ligand. Here you can see alpha subunit, beta and gamma subunit they have separated and the uh, GDP has been replaced with the GDP that is now attached with the alpha subunit of the G protein. Now the alpha subunit of GQ protein this is, a, this is a basically GQ protein because we have talked about the GS protein this is a GQ protein. So alpha subunit of GQ protein, it will go and it will bind to another uh, protein, another enzyme that is called as phospholipase. Phospholipase <coughs> C. Phospholipase C. Okay. Now this, in the previous video we have talked about that if it was a GS protein, the alpha subunit of GS protein, it, it does not activate the uh, phospholipase C. It activates the adrenal cyclase. And uh, here, here you can see the alpha subunit of GS protein, when it will uh, get activated after the attachment of ligand, it will activate adrenal cyclase. It will not activate phospholipase C. But the alpha subunit of GQ protein will activate phospholipase C. So once the phospholipase C has been activated, it will convert phosphatidyl inositol diphosphate. Let me write phosphatidyl inositol diphosphate. <coughs> 
Phospholipase C will convert PIP2 or phosphatidyl and inositol diphosphate into IP3 and DAG. IP3 inositol triphosphate and DAG is diacyl glycerol. PIP2 is basically a phospholipid present in our cells. And once uh, this alpha subunit of GQ protein will activate this phospholipase C, these uh, phospholipids molecules, PIP2, they will be converted into IP3 and DAG, diacyl glycerol. <coughs> now this DAG will activate protein kinase C. It will activate protein kinase C. And you know what are kinases? Kinases are those proteins, those enzymes which cause the phosphorylation of other protein. And when other protein get phosphorylated, they will get activated. They will get activated. So this, this protein kinase C, it will cause the phosphorylation of other protein. For example, these are proteins present in the cytoplasm. They will be phosphorylated by the what do I mean by phosphorylated? Attachment of phosphate group, PO4 minus 3 group. <coughs> when they will they will get phosphorylated by the protein kinase C, these proteins will get activated. And now these proteins, when they will get activated, obviously they will show a kind of response. These phosphokin uh, protein kinase C not only activate the cytoplasmic protein, but the uh, they can enter into the nucleus and they can cause the phosphorylation of certain transcription factor as well. So when the phosphorylation of certain transcription factor take place, obviously these transcription factor will get activated. And when these transcription factor will be activated, obviously uh, expression of certain genes will take place. And when there is expression of certain genes, obviously new proteins will be formed. Obviously when there is expression of these genes, uh, uh, when the expression of these genes will be taken place by the activation of certain transcription factor, <coughs> messenger RNA will be formed, then messenger RNA will come out of the nucleus, it will attach on the ribosome, new protein will be formed, and when new protein will be formed, obviously a kind of response will be produced. So in this way, all the hormone, all the <coughs> ligand that attach on uh, uh, the G protein, GQ protein coupled receptor they produce, uh, they can produce response by this pathway. Now let's talk about what IP3 do. Inositol triphosphate. Inositol triphosphate will be having its receptor on the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. This is a smooth endoplasmic reticulum. And we know that smooth endoplasmic reticulum is a reservoir of calcium ion. So when this IP3 it will go and attach on its receptor the calcium channel will get open they will become open so calcium will come out of the smooth endoplasmic reticulum when this calcium will come out of the smooth endoplasmic reticulum this calcium <coughs> will attach with another calcium binding protein called as colmodulin and a calcium colmodulin complex will be formed. Calcium colmodulin complex will be formed. Now this calcium colmodulin complex, it can also activate some other proteins. And once the protein will be uh, activated, response will be produced. For example, in our uh, <coughs> smooth muscles, this calcium colmodulin complex it, activate, it activate, activates the myosin light chain kinase. It activates myosin light chain kinases. These, when these uh, myosin light chain kinases will get activated, and they will get activated, smooth muscle contraction will take place. Smooth muscle contraction will take place. So it means this calcium colmodulin complex can activate some other protein as well and response will be produced. I have given you example as well. <clears throat> so this is the pathway 
that is also called as DAG and IP3 and uh, DAG pathway. This is the pathway that is by being followed by the GQ protein coupled receptor. After the attachment of ligand or after the attachment of any uh, internal uh, hormone or neurotransmitter. Now let's talk about the uh, GI protein. Let's see how GI protein uh, acts. GI protein will act exactly opposite to the G uh, S protein. We in the previous video we have talked about that the alpha domain of G S protein when it will get separated from the beta and gamma it will attach with the adenyl cyclase and it will cause the activation of adenyl cyclase. And I have explained that G I protein shows opposite response to G S protein. So if G S protein is activating the adenyl cyclase, obviously G I protein will attach with this adenyl cyclase, but G I protein will not activate adenyl cyclase. In, instead, it will inhibit the adenyl cyclase. So adenyl cyclase will be inhibited by the uh, alpha subunits of alpha subunit of G I protein, and it will be activated by the alpha subunit of G S protein. <coughs> now let's see. Now let's talk about this example, smooth muscle contraction for the better understanding. So here you can see, for example, this is the GS protein coupled receptor and this is the GI protein, pro, uh, protein coupled receptor. So when the ligand will attach with this, obviously uh, GDP will be converted into GTP, alpha, beta and uh, gamma subunits will separate and this GS protein, it will activate the adenyl cyclase, I have just explained it, it will activate the adenyl cyclase. Adenyl cyclase will convert ATP into cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP will uh, uh, cause the activation of protein kinase A and this protein kinase A will cause the activation of myosin light chain kinase and <coughs> smooth muscle contraction will take place. Why? When the ligand will attach with the G I protein coupled receptor again all these subunits will get separated but GI protein it will inhibit it will inhibit the adenyl cyclase so it means ATP will not be converted into cyclic AMP or this conversion will get reduced and now this cyclic AMP uh, will not be able to activate the myosin light chain kinase and the smooth muscle contraction will not take place we can say that relative smooth muscle relaxation will take place. So GS protein was causing the smooth muscle contraction and G uh, I protein was causing the smooth muscle relaxation. It was all about the G proteins in which I have explained the mechanism of GS protein, GI protein and GQ protein. I hope you like my lecture. Please don't forget to subscribe my channel and press the bell icon so that you may get notification for the future video. Thank you so much. Uh, in next uh, video, I'll be talking about the mechanism of uh, uh, different hormones, including pituitary uh, gland hormones.